and we'll, we'll go down that. We'll talk about the temple later on, okay? There's the first temple, the second temple, and apparently there's going to be a third temple, and that is also, uh, you know, we see the first day church, the second day church, and the third day church, okay? There's a lot of analogies here in the scripture. But what's happening here, Jesus grabs his disciples and pulls them away from the religious crowd. And says, come, let's, let's go aside here. And what did he do? He took them up into the mountains. Okay? And to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, I've been in Israel. Dr. Michael was born in Israel. He knows Israel like the back of his hand probably. But uh, up in the mountains there, there's a place called Caesarea Philippi. There's one on the coast as well. I've been to that one. But the one up in the mountains... Uh, it's called Caesarea Philippi, and it's a, it's an interesting place because Caesarea Philippi was nearby the Jordan River, where it comes out of the the mountains uh, that what is now called the Golan Heights, I believe. Okay, so it comes out of the mountains there and goes down into the Jordan Valley. And it's an interesting place because there's a group of rocks right there and they are called the gates of hell. That is the name of the rocks and it is really important and it's an important place even to this day because that was Satan's headquarters right there. Okay, that, 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 there's a reason why it was called the gates of hell. And it's interesting that Jesus took his disciples away from the religious crowd, took them up into what today is called the Golan Heights, the Caesarea Philippi. And I believe he was standing right on those rocks. When he, uh, and and you've, got to, you've got to know the picture here. Okay, He had a relationship with his disciples. They, they, they were buddies. Even though they respected him and everything else, they used to hang out together. Okay? And just, and just when you get a bunch of guys hanging out together, they talk in junk and this and that, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So they're used to this environment where it's just them and, and the Lord. And so one day Jesus has got them in this place called Caesarea Philippi. And he's saying to his disciples, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they say, well, some say this, some say that, some say John the Baptist, you know. And they're hanging out. They're in this relaxed atmosphere, hanging out. And so Jesus is saying, who, who do men say that I am? They say, well, some say this, some say that. He said, but who do you say that I am? And suddenly they realize that there's a point coming here. And there's a hidden agenda coming, okay? And he's got their backs up to the wall. <clears throat> Excuse me. He wants to know, who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? <clears throat> and up jumps Peter. And uh, I, I normally call him Mac the Mouth because he was always running his mouth. He's a fisherman and some of you live fairly close to fishing towns around here. And you've seen those fishing boats come in in the morning and you don't want to be around the fishermen because they don't know too much else other than cuss words. And Peter was no different whatsoever. That's his, his whole life had been cussing and everything else. And so he's hanging out with Jesus and Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, he can never keep his mouth closed. He has to run it every time. But this time it was different. He jumps up and he says, you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, yes. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. How did he get it? He got it by revelation. He opened his mouth. Look at your neighbor and say, your mouth. He opened his mouth and he was about to run it and out came something different that he did not expect to come out. He had not planned that. That was an off-the-cuff question that Jesus asked him, a very pointed question, but it was like off-the-cuff. He hadn't practiced for it. He just opened his mouth and out it came. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, yes, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not given this to you. But you have heard this from my Father. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. I believe he was 
was standing on those rocks when he said that. Because those rocks are actually called the gates of hell. And we won't even go into that today. It is a horrendous reason why they were called the gates of hell. Okay? What I'm wanting to point out to you, he said, and upon this rock I will build my church. I will. We're talking future tense here. In other words, this church has not been established. Everybody say his church. His, his church. church. His church has not yet been established, but you have just had a taste of what it's going to be. What is it going to be? It's going to be a prophetic utterance. God using people and speaking through people. Speaking through a fisherman. An uneducated fisherman for goodness sake. God spoke through an uneducated fisherman who had no, no great vocabulary. You know, and, and all, all he could do was cuss and yet he stood up and God himself spoke through Peter and said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's not the physical rock up in the Golan Heights, okay? It is the rock of revelation coming from God through man. That is what the prophetic church is about. Jesus' church, my church, is a prophetic church that had not yet been established, but what was going to be established after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Okay? Later on, two chapters later, we're talking, Jesus is talking about dealing with the sinning brother. And if you have a brother that sinned against you, go to him and him alone. And talk to him about it. I'm just putting it in my own words now, okay? If he won't listen to you, take it to the elders. Take the issue to the elders. If he won't listen, or, or, or take it to two or three witnesses. If they, if you cannot get an agreement, then take it to the church. Take it to the church. He's not talking future tense. He's talking present tense. What are we saying? Church has already been established. I grew up in Africa. I had the privilege to grow up in Africa. And... I'm not proud of everything I did, okay? So some of the stuff we just we, we miss out on that one. I used to hang out in villages quite a bit. I had buddies in the village. We'd go and hang out in the village. And, 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 and uh, very often the, the, the tribes in Africa and the village folk, they would be much the same as, as the American Indians, we call them, the Native Americans. Okay? They, they, you know, they would hang out together and occasionally they... they Elders would come together and they'd sit in a group and they'd pull out the pipe and smoke it. Now, I don't know what they were smoking here. I do know what they were smoking in Africa, okay? <laughs> and the pipe would go around and, you know, I was a little white boy that just used to hang out in the village occasionally, you know, and so I'd sit there and smoke the pipe with them. I couldn't even get home after that. I was legless, okay? <laughs> but I learned a lot. It was a group of people who would gather together, and they were the elders of the village were there. This is a cultural thing that the Bible actually describes in many different ways, but it, and I'm just going to run through them, okay? Uh, there's several definition, definitions here. I'm going to speak from Young's and the Tyndall translation. Basically refers to the congregation, or the gathering, or another one is the invisible ones. Can you believe that? Or the synagogue, or the called out ones. Or the called out ones. Now we just make a, a, a reference to church. There are several definitions of church right there. And they don't all mean the same thing. Now, a synagogue could be a building. It is a building, am I right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so understand something. In this series that I'm going to be teaching, I am not against church buildings. Amen. 
I'm not against it. I've seen God bless those church buildings, okay? So you cannot say God's not in the building. But when we talk about the New Testament church, we are not talking about a building. We are talking about the called out ones of God. Amen. Those who have been set aside by God Himself. Now going back to the village, what you would have there is a village gathering. That was a cultural thing. Yes. It wasn't necessarily a godly thing. When we left those gatherings, God was the last thing on our minds, okay? We didn't have any minds at that stage. <laughs> we'd been, we, we'd been uh, smoking whatever it was, okay? We won't mention what it was. And we used to drink the local brew, uh, which was called kachasu. Uh, another, uh, that was the local name, kachasu. Um, the definition of kachasu was kill me quick. <laughs> if you drank too much of that, you were dead. And very often when they were brewing it, they'd brew it in a drum and they were busy drinking it while they're brewing it and the, and the rats would get in there and die in there, so you don't know what you're drinking. Okay, but you drank it so it tastes like hell itself, it produced hell itself in you. Okay, and that's why they called, called it kill me quick. Many people were blind in Africa because they drank too much kachasu. They went blind. If they carried on drinking, they were dead. Okay, it was that simple. Anyway, what, what I'm saying here, I went down a rabbit track there. Uh, what I'm saying is this. The church very often, and I believe what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 18, the church was not a godly thing. That was a cultural thing. And they might have been godly people in it. But it was a cultural thing. It was a gathering of the, uh, of, of the tribe. Or of the, the village. Whatever it was. And when Jesus was talking about dealing with a, a sinning brother. Take it to him and him alone. If you can't get into agreement. Bring in two or three others. And, and try and, and get the, the, the problem established. If it's dealt with if you can't do that then take it to the whole church in other words the whole village That's right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hello mm -hmm. and suddenly we have interpreted that thing and built something else out of it let me say this that Jesus' church started as a fellowship of believers in Israel what today is modern day Israel Okay, that's where the church started in Jerusalem even. Okay, but it spread from there. It spread quickly into other nations. It started out as a fellowship of believers. And that's what God intended it to be. If you need a church building, okay, that's no problem. We'll help you get a building, but don't lose sight of what I have said. Because what I have said is go into all the world. That's right. Okay? Don't lose sight of that. And we see in the early church, in the book of Acts, we see this mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit touching everybody's lives. And so what did they do? Probably built themselves some synagogues, okay? And started meeting in the synagogues of church buildings. Now we refer to a church as a building. It never has been a building per se. A church is not a place where you go. Church is a people who you are. That's right. And you are a prophetic people Amen. that God has set aside and pulled out. That's right. Of the world system, Colossians 1.13, God has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness and, and, and translated us into the kingdom of love of His Son. Amen. You have been taken out of one system, even though you might be living in that system, you are no longer a part of it. You're living above it. You have God's Word in you. You have God's Spirit in you. You are now able to function above the world system. Amen. You don't need to darken your lives with the world system. You are above it. You have been translated. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. He went on to say, unless a man be born again, you shall not enter into it. 
You won't be able to partake of it. You won't be able to, to, to reap the benefits of it. Okay? What are we saying here? I'm so glad you lost. <laughs> okay. God has set you aside. His church is not a building, but you might meet in a building. And what happened in the book of Acts there, when, when there was this mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they started doing church. And they loved doing church. That's where you get into your comfort zone, in church. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yes. So what did God do? He loved His church. Remember, the church is not a building. It is not an organization. It is not a 501c3. It is a people who you are. It is a living organism. Not an organization, but an organism. Okay? So what happens? God loved His church so much that He saw them having church. Today we would say playing games of church. That's our modern day vocabulary. Okay, so what did God do? He loved His church so much, God raised up a great persecution. You don't have to say the devil rose up the persecution. God did that. Why? Because the scripture goes on to talk about, and they were scattered throughout the whole world, taking the word with them. Is that not the very instruction that God gave? God gave that instruction to His people. He said this, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. What was God's intention? Go ye, not stay ye. <laughs> And in Jerusalem, they were happy to stay here because, after all, that's where I was born. I've lived here all my life. Blah, blah, blah. So we start making up these excuses. We start, we start justifying our, our existence here in the church when God said, go ye. How many of you believe God loves you today more than He did the church in the book of Acts? No, just the same. Mm -hmm. Why do we think, why do we even start to imagine that He's not going to make your life uncomfortable? <laughs> Hello? He's going to make it real uncomfortable. In fact, God's going to allow a great persecution to arise. And don't, you know, God is even going to probably organize the persecution of you. <laughs> why? Because you've actually been disobedient. And I mentioned this re recently, I'll, I'll mention it again. When, when, when Jesus rose from the dead, who was it that He spoke to first? Mary Magdalene. Mary. Mary Magdalene, yeah. A woman. Yeah. Oof. And what was the first instruction? Now we, we Jesus has just risen from the dead. So now we have, we've just moved into the new covenant. Okay? So who is His First instruction to go tell the disciples. It, it was to Mary, the Magdalene. Okay, so he used a woman. He used a woman to go and give a message. Hello. That's right. So all that issue about women in ministry. Let me tell you something. The first instruction of the new covenant was to a woman. Go tell my disciples, go down to Galilee and that's where they'll meet me. Well, she was obedient. She went and did it. What, was, what did that make her? That made her the first minister of the new covenant. The first minister of the new covenant was a woman, for goodness sake. Oh, I just stood on some religious toes right there. Yes, okay. And we're going to stand. Well, I'm not going to stand on any more religious toes. I'm going to jump on them. Come on now. Yeah. We, need, we need to bust those toes because you, you, you're not listening. Okay, I know everybody here is listening. It's, it's the other fellow down the road I'm talking about. So what happens? Um, he gives that instruction to a woman, Mary. Ma Mary. Magdalene? Mm -hmm. Was she not? Yep. 
Yes. Was she not that lady who? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, she was. Yeah. 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 Was yeah. Yeah. Was she not the one who yeah. used to be of yeah. ill yeah. repute? Yeah. 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 Was she not the street walker? Yeah, was oh, 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 it's getting bad. <laughs> was she not the one? Oh my goodness, think about it. She was a hooker for goodness sake. She had been a hooker. She was no longer a hooker. She got hooked. That's right. Amen. The hooker got hooked. Yeah. And it took the Lord Jesus to hook the hooker. That's right. yes. Hello. And made her the first minister of the new covenant. That's right. That's right. Think about these things. So she was obedient. She goes down to the other disciples. Um, I can't remember whether there were 11 or 12, but, but, but what's his name had already hung himself. Uh, so the, I, I can't remember at that time if they'd actually brought in the 12, the, the replacement disciple, apostle, whatever. No. But she goes there and said, I've just seen the Lord. You know, he, he's hanging out up in the garden. And he says, she says to them, he says, go down to Galilee and that's where you'll see me. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about this and think, hang on a minute. Uh, most of us don't like Galilee. <laughs> Galilee's a tough place. The last time we were there, we remember the wind and the waves and everything else. Not a nice place. It's hot, humid, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we don't believe in women in ministry today, so you know, we, we're really having a hard time accepting this word from a, an ex-hooker of good, for goodness sake. So next thing, two of them are off in the opposite direction. We, we hear about Jesus meeting these two on the road to Emmaus. Well, I took the time one day to look up Emmaus and, and look it up on maps and everything else. Where's Emmaus? Emmaus is up in the mountains. That's in the opposite direction to Galilee. These two are in total rebellion. They cannot accept the word from a woman minister. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so they're in the opposite direction. They don't want to go down into the valley where it's hot and humid. They want to go to Emmaus. And by the way, Emmaus was a holiday resort up in the mountains. Okay, so they're heading off to a holiday resort. I don't know what's going on there. If they've got a casino there or what's going on there, I have no idea. They never made it there. Why? Because Jesus interrupted that little holiday resort and said, by the way, guys, head back to Galilee. That's in the opposite direction to where you're going. He was very gracious about it. He didn't rebuke them for it. He just turned them around and said, go. And he keeps repeating that same word, go. Okay, time and time again, we see that same word go. So, okay, so what is the church? What is the church of Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about the cultural gathering. I am talking about the called out ones of God. Amen. What is it? I took the time to ask God himself. I want you to give me a definition. I want, to, I want to know how you see your church and not what I've been taught by man because the man that taught me was taught by another man who was taught by another man who was taught by another man and somewhere down the road you are definitely going to lose some of the meaning. So I want to get it direct. From the throne room of Amen. God. I, and, and my Bible, I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit is the great teacher. Okay, so if He's the teacher and I have a relationship with Him and He lives in me and I live in Him, then guess what? Uh, we have, we're supposed to have relationship here. We're supposed to have communication here. So guess what? You have the ability to go direct to the Father and say, excuse me, would you mind sharing this with me. Would you mind sharing your heart with me? Because Jesus said, don't you, don't you know that you have the mind of Christ? Actually, Jesus didn't say that, did he? Don't worry. I'm just testing you. So anyway, but the scripture says that you have the mind of Christ. Right? If you have the mind of Christ, 
He lives in you. You live in Him. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He's been given to you as a teacher amongst many other things. Okay, so why can we not just go direct to the Father and ask Him, Hello, can you show me yes, something? Right. My Bible says the whole of creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. What is the church? I believe it's the sons of God. Hello? It's the sons of God who have been revealed to the world. Not just because you're a nice person. Well, I don't sin anymore. Guess what? That's got nothing to do with anything. Well, I'm a morally nice person now, and I didn't used to be. Hello? That's not what it's about. My God is a supernatural God. And if He dwells in me and I'm in Him, guess what? I'm a supernatural being. And it's taken me a long time to work through the religious clouds. I started saying something earlier and I got sidetracked. I'm going to go back to it. The church started in, in Israel as a fellowship of the called out ones of God. It spread to Italy and became a religion. It went to Greece and became a culture. It went to the UK. No, that was the culture. In Greece, it was the philosophy. It became a philosophy. And when it went to the UK, it became a culture. Then it came to the US and became a business. Come on. Come on. 501c3 gives you the tax exemption, but you have to become a business. And Uncle Sam is the head of that business, not Jesus Christ. Well, you might as well get excited and shout at them because it's the truth. It is the truth anyhow. Okay. It's time, folks. Uncle Sam don't need to be the head of the church. He was never intended to be the head of the church. Right. The head of the church is there for one person only, and that's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the head of the church. And so we must understand it is not about an organization. Never has been. It is not about a, 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 a building. It is about the people who you are. That's right. That are called out by God for specific purpose, for specific training. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did ask the Lord, give me a definition of your church. Number one, he gave me three definitions, not one. Number one, he said, my church as an individual is to be a law enforcement agent of the new covenant. My church as an individual is to be a law enforcement agent of the new covenant. Number two, my church as a collective body of believers is to be a law enforcement agency of the new covenant. Have you ever read the scripture in the old covenant where it says one can put a thousand to flight, yes. two can put ten thousand to flight? Mm -hmm. The synergistic laws of two believers coming together, or three, or four. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Okay? Nothing pleases Him more than a gathering. And that's why the Scripture says, don't forsake the gathering together of the saints. We're going to have a gathering. Are you coming over to my place? We're having a gathering. <laughs> Okay? We're having a gathering. It's going to be a supernatural gathering. Yeah. We're going to worship the Lord a little bit. Yeah. We're going to hear from God a little yeah. bit. And then we're going to go and do what He tells us to do. That part. Yeah. Amen. And we are going to manifest what He wants us to manifest. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Number two, my church is a collective body of believers is a law enforcement agency of the new covenant. And number three, my church... My church is the empowerment of my kingdom. My church is the empowerment of my kingdom. 
Let me just back up on that a little bit. What are we talking about here? Jesus went to the cross and accomplished a lot. He defeated Satan. He made a public spectacle of, of him openly. Triumphing over him in it. Okay, so what are we talking about here? As a, an immature believer, what we do sometimes, we call out to God as an immature believer. We call out to God and say, Lord, help me. He says, yeah, fine, I'll help you. I sometimes use the analogy of a little boy who wants to learn how to be a boxer. He says to Daddy, Daddy, I want you to show me, I, I want to be, a, I want to start boxing. Dad says, okay, there's a club down the road, I'll take you down there. He puts his little boy in the boxing ring and up comes the boxer and the guy looks at him, boom, flat on his back. Gets up crying, his bloody nose and everything. <laughs> Daddy takes him, it's okay, my son, I'll go and clean you up, you know. A week or two later, Daddy, Daddy, I want to go boxing again. Okay, <laughs> let's take you down there. It's going to bring you to mat physical maturity, okay? So, Daddy takes him down. He gets in the ring with the professional. The professional knocks him out. Bang, done. Bloody nose again, over and done with, crying. Oh, 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 oh. A few weeks later, Daddy, Daddy, I want to go boxing. Daddy says, okay, son. I'm not going to help you out this time. You need to learn how to do it. I am not going to bail you out. So often in this world system, we are, in the world's church I call it, we are asking God to bail us out all the time. And God wants you to come to maturity. God wants you to take a hold of his book and find out what he's done for you, what he's already given to you, and stop bellyaching about it. Right. Get up there and do it. Amen. You are never going to come to maturity unless you start doing what you have already been told to do, you have already been empowered to do. A great example is in Isaiah 53. Isaiah said, surely by your stripes we are healed. He's speaking about something that is going to happen in the future. In 1 Peter 2.24, we're looking back and he's saying, sure, by his stripes you were healed. Isaiah was saying, this is what will happen. Peter's saying, this is what has already happened. Right. The price has been paid for your healing. Amen. Enforce it. Amen. Enforce it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Doom down the road, I don't care if he's a member of your church. He's Dr. Doom and what he is trained to do is stand him in your face, get in your face, and proclaim a diagnostic curse over your body. This is what is wrong with you. You are going to die. Now we can maybe help with chemo and this and that. I want to tell you something. That stuff is straight from the pit of hell. That is going back into the world system. And you've got no place been there. When I talk about Dr. Doom, I'm not talking about Dr. John, okay? <laughs> He's not a medical doctor anyway, per se. But uh, he, he, he does have a way of getting in your head. <laughs> and, and that is of God. He's been trained by God to do. I have a doctor friend in, uh, who, who deals with cancer uh, in Dallas, Texas. He uses my products. Um, I had breakfast with him a few weeks ago right here in, in uh, Clearwater, down in Clearwater. And uh, he operates by a word of knowledge. He'll get his patients on the phone and they'll, they'll ask him, oh, you know, I've been diagnosed with this and that. And he said, okay, uh, this is where the problem stands. This is what's going on. This is how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And we can fix it over the phone. Oh, wow. Yeah. You, you guys have met him too, yeah. John and for real. came were with me for breakfast. Incredible guy. Why? He's, he's the whole of creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. He's one of the sons of God. Yes. You know, 
He can read. He can read your mail. Did he read your mail? <laughs> I was sitting across the table from Kim, and I was sitting. I was sitting next to this man, and he starts reading Kim's mail. I thought, Oh my God! <laughs> Why? It wasn't to, to condemn or anything no, like that. No, no. It was to lift Kim up, saying, look, yeah. this is what's going on in your life right now. And Kim was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mind me talking not about it. <laughs> doctor mentioned, he, he did not know anything about us. Yeah. And he looked at her and told us and explained why our daughter's horse died. Yeah. He, told, I, he explained it, the whole thing, and yeah. he, nobody told him anything. It was like Jesus sitting in a chair, mm -hmm. and he explained everything about how what made the horse, what happened, what, what came upon the horse, everything. I love the way you put Your that. Mic. Sorry? Your mic. Can't hear. What is it? Is it turn it off? Yes, go on. Battery is dead. Okay, so uh, I invited John and Kim to that meeting, and uh, and he knew nothing about them, but read them out, and you know it's just like something you said right there. It was like, let me just get this battery in here. It's like a holy fear. <clears throat> it was like a holy, beautiful fear, wholesome fear of the Lord, like Jesus said that. It was like uh, sitting at the table with Jesus, wasn't it? Yes. It was yes. like sitting right there at the table with Jesus. And he was talking, he was reading everybody's mouth, telling everybody, <laughs> and just matter of fact, Good spirit. just like hanging out with Jesus. It, it was the same thing, you walked out of there, even, even the waitress, he, he had a word for her, she came out of there. Wow. <laughs> what? She just served Jesus. It's not just Dr. Rankin that I'm talking about here. It's you. It is you. We're talking to you. My brother and sister here were down on the island last week. We had them up here to come and share what, what happened on the island. What happened on the island? Uh, Jesus showed up on the island. His name was Carlos. Amen. Jesus showed that, that they received him as, as they would receive Christ. Why? Whenever you're a visitor like that, you, you've come to see them. There's so much we can glean. I, I, I'm out of time here, folks, so I need to wind this up. But no one understands as mature believers. You're never going to reach maturity until you start doing what you're told. If he says, go ye... This couple here went in. They went down to, to Dominican Republic. How many? Six, six and a half thousand souls saved? Over 6,900 souls. 6,900? Yes. Wow, yes. almost 7,000 souls. You know, yes, I've been in meetings with, with Reinhard Bonnke when there's a, a million people around. Mm -hmm. It is unbelievable the, the, the energy in that place. I, I'll just share this quick testimony with you. <clears throat> Something used to happen in Reinhardt's meetings that was so unusual. Everybody would be standing. Thousands and thousands of people would be standing there shoulder to shoulder, crammed in. And, and uh, you know, one time Reinhardt had the biggest tent in the world. It could seat 34,000 people. Uh, in the last meeting we ever had in that tent, we, we crammed 43,000 people into it. Okay? And it was, it was close fellowship. And, uh, and God used to move in there, so we had to do away with the tent, and we went to open air meetings uh, where there were just literally hundreds of thousands. Later on, it became millions of people would show up. And something would happen right there in the middle of the crowd. While he was talking, suddenly a hole appeared in, in the crowd of people. They were all getting slain in the spirit. There was no catches. No catches at all. A hole just started in the middle and just grew outwards in a circle. And people were just going out in the spirit. Woo! A 
sweeping mighty wind of the Spirit of God. Nobody was pushing anybody. Nobody had the ministry of pushing. <laughs> <laughs> they were busy worshiping God next when they were lying on the floor. <laughs> you know? Folks, no one understand. We have we are so privileged right now to be living in this third millennial church, to be partakers of it. Next week I'm going to get into it more. We're going to go back to Hosea and start expounding on that a lot more. Come, let us return to the Lord. That indicates you haven't been hanging out with Him. Okay, you're not, you're not bosom buddies with the Lord at the moment. Why? Because we're too busy doing our own thing. And so often it's too busy doing the church thing. Okay, and I'm not saying that to be critical, but we have to understand we are living now in a new era. Yes. That era started round about the year 2000. That was 2000 years from Christ. Now, if you're an Ethiopian living in Ethiopia, they don't have 12 months in the year. They have 13 months in the year. So if I'm not mistaken, right now, 2018 is actually 2011 back in Ethiopia. All right. Interesting phenomenon that because it changes so much in the prophetic timetable. You can start to see maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're right. I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just saying, look, there's more than one calendar in place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's two or three different calendars in place. Yeah. Okay, so we need to understand. But round about the year 2000, we left the second millennial church and moved into the third millennial church. And the third millennial church really is a type of the kingdom of God. But his church in the kingdom of God. There you go. Okay, and, and we need to understand that this is a whole different ballgame. So many of you, not only sitting here, but on, on Facebook, on, on, you know, around the world, have been getting real uncomfortable just lately. Mm -hmm. I, cannot, I cannot think what's going on. Just things aren't working right anymore. I'll tell you exactly what's going on. God's, God loves you so much, He's making you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to get out of that comfort zone. I'm part of a referral group for my business. And something God had me do recently uh, that was so out of character for me. Uh, but I had to get out of my comfort zone. He had me get up at a, at a at what, what was it, a, the expo. We had the annual expo where the hundreds of the members came together and we were doing our thing and there were some presentations. God had me stand up and do a secular rap. <laughs> do you know how out of character that was for me? I didn't do it for their benefit. I did it for my benefit. I had to do a secular rap. God even gave me the words. He gave me four different verses. And one night, just I woke up, just wrote it all down. Boom, 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 done. Okay, got up and rapped. It was so out of character for me. To the two now. I didn't do it for their benefit. I did it for mine. Yes, it is on Facebook somewhere. I'm not telling you where. <laughs> I don't want you even looking at that thing. Okay? Tell it was so the tune? much. The tune? Was the tune? Sorry? Tell the tune. Tell the tune. The tune. <laughs> well, nobody here knows the tune anyway because they've been protected for so long. It went something like this. And it was by Queen. Queen of Tina. And it's called We Will Rock. Queen of the Group Queen. And God had me do that rap. And I thought, wow. God is breaking down the barriers. He's making me uncomfortable. Why? Yes, I've spoken to crowds of thousands before. I, you know, it doesn't phase me out doing that. But I, I was phased out doing something that was so uncomfortable for me to get up and do something like that. I have stood against all these rock bands and everything else for years, even though when I was in my younger days, I used to like those rock bands. 40-odd uh, years back almost, uh, 
Jesus saved me and, and delivered me from all of that junk. Now he's saying it's okay. I'm not saying the rock music's okay. Don't, don't, don't. Okay. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is he put me back into the world system to be effective. Amen. To be effective. Exactly what we saw that breakfast time. Effectiveness. We sat there having breakfast with Jesus in the form of a medical doctor right. with a difference. I'm not criticizing the medical profession. I'm just saying there's a huge big difference between what we have known as the medical profession and where Jesus is taking us. We don't need those people so much anymore. When you've got somebody like Dr. Mike Rankin, that's his name, Okay, when, you, when you're sitting at the table with him, you know you've just been sitting with Jesus. Amen. It's as simple as that. 